everybody. Uh, you're here this afternoon with us and Dr. Nafisa. And uh, I am so excited today about today's topic because I know a lot of you struggle with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and we're going to do a really deep dive into some of the mechanisms behind that. You're going to find some really fascinating information from Dr. Nafisa today um, that her uh, practice, Gordon Medical Associates, with, was actually instrumental in some of the research behind. So stay tuned for that. Um, before we start and before I give her a formal introduction, I want to just tell you a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you don't already know, you can find all of these videos on my YouTube channel. Um, so just go to YouTube and find my name, Jill Carnahan, and you can find all the 50 plus interviews there for free. And I'd love if you subscribe or leave feedback there or share those videos if you find them helpful. Um, you can also rewatch them here on Facebook and on the podcast. So um, just all things uh, medical uh, here. And then if you do want information about blogs, information about Lyme disease, co-infections, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, other topics, uh, you can find that on my website at jillcarnahan.com. And if we do mention any products or um, services, you can find those at drjillhealth.com. So Dr. Navisa, I would love to formally introduce you, and I'm so glad you're here today. Um, Dr. Parpia has spent the last decade treating patients with complex chronic illness from all over the United States and the world. Her specialization is patients with tick-borne illness, environmentally acquired illness, mold mycotoxin illness, autoimmunity, fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue. Sounds real familiar. <laughs> External factors to the body, such as environmental toxic burden, pathogens, diet and lifestyle affect the balance of internal factors. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. Over or under expression of immunity, infection susceptibility, epigenetic expression and cellular and biochemical function, mood and the microbiome. All of these things are some of the things that we're gonna talk about that affect our mitochondria, which expresses fatigue and some of these other things. Each of these aspects is different um, for every patient we see. Investigating to discover and remove the underlying cause while providing symptom relief. Um, she uses cutting edge lab testing and deep intuition applied to the full range of scientific data to unravel the mystery of each patient. She then creates a carefully treatment, sorry, creates a carefully crafted treatment plan, um, highly personalized and healing. She uses a synergistic blend of regenerative medicine, oral and IV micronutrient therapies, peptides, botanical medicine, pharmaceutical injection therapies, functional nutrition, and lifestyle counseling. She sees patients at Gordon Medical in the San Francisco Bay Area and previously worked in uh, Dr. Klinghardt's clinic. She's also, as I am, on the ICI board um, in scientific medical advisory for the Neurohacker Collective. Um, what a absolute honor and delight to have you, Dr. Nafisa. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Dr. Jill, for having me. Such an honor to be here. Yeah. So, and we kind of met through the ICI board, but I know this about the work you've done. And it's just, like I said, it's an honor. It's so parallel when I read your bio, it's, you know, we're all doing our things in our corners of the world, trying to solve the mysteries of these chronic illnesses. Um, before we dive into chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, I'd love to hear just a little bit. And I know our listeners would about your story and kind of how you got into medicine and healing. Tell us just a little bit about your journey into this field. Yeah. So I always knew that, that I wanted to help people in their healing. I began as a yoga instructor and, and the more I taught yoga, the more I realized I wanted to go deeper with people, particularly in, in, in illness and, and in health and restoring illness into health. And so I, I went to Bastyr and I studied naturopathic medicine there. Mm -hmm. And it was, wasn't until I was in the offices of Dr. Dietrich Klinghart when I got graduated and I saw people who were very, very, very sick. And that was when my heart just went out to these patients. I could see that they were suffering, you know, but they weren't treated at other clinics before going to his clinic with very much respect. They were told this is all in their head um, or they're just aging and there was minimal treatment or min minimal diagnosis offered to them. And I could just feel the depth of their illness. And it was, it was painful to see the judgments that were put upon them. Mm -hmm. So I, I, want, I, I wanted to help in yes. helping create treatment and protocols and really dive deep with these people and help them out of the, the suffering that they were having a hard time coming out of. Yeah, gosh, I love that because most of us who go into medicine of some form, it's this healer within us that really does want to just help and understand. And I think especially those of us who end up with 
environmental toxicity, mold, pathogens, chronic illness. Um, no one in their right mind would choose this unless they were a healer, right? right exactly. <laughs> it, it is definitely the hardest, most complex form of medicine. Um, I'm sure you agree. I love it. And I know you do too. Like mm-hmm. I love the complexity. I always say the more complex, the better, but it's really, really difficult sometimes. And these are not, these are the cases that the most the conventional doctors don't want to see sadly. So exactly. it's good that you and I, you know, are, are welcoming them to our practice. Yes. Um, so you've had such a great experience with some amazing medical partners. Um, you were with Dr. Klinghardt originally. Was that right after you graduated? Yeah, mm-hmm. right after I graduated. Excellent. Yeah. Fantastic. You probably got a little bit of good in, information on Lyme and co-infections and, and all of that there. And he's yeah. so good at some of the environmental toxicity and the, the stuff that's on the cutting edge. I always feel like the Europeans are way ahead of us. And because he's originally from Europe, he I, I love his perspective. He's not jaded like our many, right? <laughs> right? Exactly. So it was really wonderful. That's where I first learned, you know, right after school, really how to, how to work with this population about the tick-borne illnesses and mold and, and detoxification therapies. And then, and then from there, I really made it my own. Yeah. So, yeah. You probably really, um, was there anything in particular with that experience that you learned as far as how to approach a chronic infection or, fi- well, first of all, we're talking about chronic fatigue fibromyalgia. So say you had a patient fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue from your early days, was there anything that sticks in your mind about lessons that you learned about how to approach them? Absolutely. So the first was to detoxify them first. So to to find out what the toxic burden is. So testing through different labs, so looking at different heavy metals or um, different chemicals, glyphosate, different pesticides and understanding what that burden is, because if we detoxify them first, then, then we can get the immune system to be more modified. We can, we can get it to, to be more able to handle the killing of infections. So. What a great pearl. And for those of you listening, you've probably been to doctors or like, oh, let's start these antibiotics. But what you're saying, which I've seen that as well, it's like the body of its toxic load, if it's bucket is full. And that's usually the ones that are coming to see us because some of that pain and fibromyalgia types of stuff, again, we'll go deep into why that happens. And some of the reasons behind it is from the toxic burden in the tissues, right? So if you yeah. take a person like that, they have infections that need treating, but you throw these even herbal antibiotics, but for sure uh, medications, it's too much for their system to handle, isn't it? Right. They'll actually backfire. A lot of times they've got this hyperactivity in the immune system on, on one hand, they've got a hyperactive immune system. And on another hand of the immune system, it's, it, it's, it's too weak to even mount an appropriate immune response. So many times if we try to treat them with the antibiotics, herbal or pharmaceutical first, they'll be sensitive to those treatments. So we have yes. to decrease the toxic load and get the mast cells in order first. And then they can I love it. that order because it's so important. I've, I've noticed that with my own practice as well, where again, if there's infection and toxin and mast cell activation, which is a common, you know, trio and yeah. chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, and you really can't go to treatment until you start with getting that mast cells calmed down and the detoxification, at least under control. Um, what are some of the things when they first come in like that, would you, what kind of testing panels would you do for the initial assessment? Yeah. So I like to do the Great Plains Mm -hmm. panel where I'm gonna look at their glyphosate, mycotoxins. Most of them of my patients do have a high mycotoxin load and also um, their tox panel while I'm looking at a lot of chemicals. I'll also do the doctor's data heavy metal provocation, but I'm also gonna look at metals unprovoked first, just from LabCorp, just urinate in a cup or have their blood taken at LabCorp looking for the ones that LabCorp will look at like mercury, lead, aluminum, arsenic, by the way, I'm seeing a lot of arsenic yes, in people's too. blood. And I think that's from the fires. It's not something I saw in previous years. It's all of a sudden this year. Whoa, lots of arsenic. I bet you're right. I, I suspect with the fires, there's definitely a lot of metals that were released mm-hmm. and I'm seeing more and more aluminum in all of my patients. Me too. Yes. Yeah which I didn't see, and isn't it? And I'm like, where else is it coming from? Cause we know like vaccinations over time can be a source, aluminum cookware. Um, what are some other sources of aluminum that you think of when you see aluminum? Is there anything else that you think of? You know, I recently, I had um, a drummer. I have a drummer in my practice and, and he drummed barefoot and there was aluminum on the pedal. Wow. And, <laughs> and his aluminum was through the roof. I just measured it. So <laughs> 
Wow. That's yeah. so, that's so fascinating. Isn't it funny when you find one of those where you're like, oh, I think this is from this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and arsenic too. And I think it's more in the rainwater, but probably from the fires and then the rain and the soils. And yeah. So, um, wow, very good. Um, yeah. And then one thing we, we kind of glossed over, we talked about, um, you know, like how you got into this medicine, but um, is there anything else that interests you about this population? I mean, we talked a little bit about the helping the healer within you, but because again, this is a population that is um, very complex, <laughs> and, but you must love to solve problems. Is that one of your- love, I love to solve problems. I love to solve human Problem. Yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. Not the smart <laughs> stuff or the <laughs> Not an engineer yeah. or an accountant, yeah. but the right. human, you know, yeah. and, but it is, it's, it's very much a mystery. It's very much a, a, a puzzle and each person is their own mystery. So while I run the same labs for everybody, I'm going to find different pieces and, and one person will react very differently than another um, to treatment or from the same exposure. A lot of that has to do with the genes. So speaking of labs, I like to I like to use the Intellix DNA mm -hmm. um, lab. So I found that they really looked at how the SNPs will interact with one another, as opposed to just here's a SNP or right. there's a SNP. They'll look at them together, and they really uh, called the research to look at what what diseases are related to to which um, genes that are acting in symphony with one another. So it's it's expensive. Oh, this is great. I just started doing this. I have a couple patients pending. I did it on myself, and it's pending. Yeah. And I've got Sharon coming on, so stay tuned for the show because in hey. that month, I've got Sharon <laughs> on, and I'm so excited because we'll have her talk about that. She's the expert, the medical director of Intellic DNA. Yeah. So yeah. I love that you're using that because I bet mm -hmm. there's so many genetic tests out there, aren't there? Yeah, I and found this one. This one is the most informative. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. Um, so say you have someone, uh, and again, we're going to get to fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue in a moment in the cell danger response, which I didn't want you to talk about. But before we go there, say you do have someone with arsenic or metals, or um, so say they have some, a little bit of uh, mass cell activation, they have chronic pain and chronic infection and toxic burden and all these things. If you do find metals, are you going to do that early on detoxification? Are you going to do maybe some treatment? Where would you order that in, in yeah. your treatment plan? I think it depends on the person, but most of my patients, I, I have to treat mass cell activation syndrome first. Usually they come to me with that. They don't even know they have it. So I just want to calm down the immune system. That's, that's the hyperactivity mm -hmm. immune system that I want to calm down. I use peptide therapies very often with that. I, I like to use thymus and beta-4 yes. to help calm down the immune system. I'll use BPC-157 as well to help with um, decreasing inflammation. I'll give them sleep peptides. Often mm -hmm. they need to sleep before they're even ready to detox. Sometimes they're constipated. Yeah. So I need to deal with the constipation yeah. before they're ready to detox or else there'll just be a backlog mm -hmm. of, of toxicants that, that aren't exiting the system. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they, they have issues with their kidneys. Mm -hmm. So we have to work with that. So often with these patients, I'm calming down their immune system while I'm working with other systems that aren't quite ready for detox. I'm doing like a, a pre-tox for them, like mm -hmm. herbs to support, mm -hmm. right? And then I'll retest some labs, see where they're at and also see where they're at with the way they're feeling. And then we'll begin chelation therapy. That's tremendous. And I always admire some of my best learnings are from my naturopathic friends, because I feel like you guys have such a great training in some of those detox um, what's the name of, for, from naturopathic medicine of the detox pathways? Is there a name? The amuncteries. Yeah. I like <laughs> that time. Cause I mean, I've learned that over time, right? Yeah. Now, but like traditional allopathic medicine, we're not taught about this, no. <laughs> which, yeah. is sad, which is why most doctors, you know, unless they go at ed extra education, um, they don't even know. Like, I feel like you guys have a lot to teach us in this, in this way. So tremendous. Um, what are the things would you do? Cause we know, you know, some of the homeopathic remedies or drainage remedies or things. What about non-herbals, non-homeopathics, like other, like maybe Epsom salt baths or alkaline water. Do you have any sort of just environmental or lifestyle things that are good for detox that you like for most of your patients? Yeah. Most of them actually do well with coffee enemas. Mm -hmm. Strange as that sounds. And actually, no, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> it helps them helps their liver to to continue you know um de uh, detoxifying yeah and, um you know saunas i think are really important or at least getting the sweat going because the, the skin is the largest organ of detoxification um and of course making sure that they're not using products mm -hmm. that have chemicals 
and yeah. toxins in them that they're eating organic as much as they possibly can. Fantastic. Yeah. And do you do uh, castor oil packs or dry brushing yeah. or some of those? Yes. Yes. Castor oil packs, dry brushing, oil pulling. Yeah. So some, I'll use a combination of um, a very classic naturopathic techniques along with, with this patient population. I have to use a lot of medications. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Because Definitely, especially with the MCAS, you really sometimes need to layer four, five, six things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it turns out, you know, when I went to naturopathic school, these were the treatments that were mm-hmm. that were taught to us, and, and they're wonderful for for the population that's not extremely sick. Yes, yes. And, they're, and and for the people that are extremely sick, they're excellent, supportive, and I consider them foundational. But then I have to go into um, stronger. Right, right. I love it though, because we're like pulling from both worlds. Because I like yeah. learn from the homeopathic, naturopathic world, and then, but we still need medications, of course, on both ends. So that's yeah. really great. Um, yeah. So, so we talked about your interest and kind of, and so let's go. Let's dive into what's behind these illnesses, because there's so many. I'll, let, I'll just let you talk a little bit about what's behind, and then after that, we can go into the cell danger. I definitely want to talk about that. So be, behind these illnesses, and what was so great is the bio that you, that I read for you. You literally kind of listed what's behind these illnesses in your bio. I love that. But talk a little bit about what, so someone has fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue and is listening. What might be some of the causes behind that? Right. So in, in classic fibromyalgia, they say there's no cause, right? And then you right. give them Lyrica and they're supposed to be better. Most of my patients are not like that. They're not, if I give them Lyrica, it's not going to really help me right. a little bit for a couple of weeks and then nothing. Mm-hmm. So Usually I'm looking for pathogens, often parasites, viruses, tick-borne illnesses, mold, yeah. um, dental occult infections. That's very common, Huge, isn't it? Mm-hmm. right? Um, sinus infections, which I think is overlooked a lot. I, I bet you're thinking the same thing actually about the sinus. Yeah. It's so close to the brain. Mm-hmm. And I'm finding a lot of the funguses or mark-ons in people's sinuses. And once I treat that, the brain fog begins to resolve. So I think of the inflammatory cytokines, the, the bugs, right, that are in the sinuses. How I close find this to be one of the biggest missing pieces of people who've been to more mold treatment other places. I'm like, did anyone treat your sinuses? And like, no. I'm no. Like, well, this is a really big deal. So <laughs> exactly. yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, and I'll treat the sinuses the same way I treat the gut, actually, by mm-hmm. killing the infections, restoring yeah. The, the whole thing. And, um, and so, what do you like, let's pause there real quick. Cause what do you like to use? I mean, I have some herbal favorites and some prescription favorites, but what is some of your preferred uh, ways to treat the sinuses? Do you do irrigation? Do you do sprays? Do you compound? Do you do herbs? What yeah, I, I do compounding very often. I'm going to start with Argentin silver. Mm-hmm. I found that if people do this, um, if they nebulize it, not just spray it, but they atomize it. So it really goes up high. Then um, I've seen that really reduce brain fog. If they do this and this is a tall order, like four or five times a day for two weeks, it's changed people's lives. People who are not chronically ill, but they have brain fog, that has changed their life. Just doing that. And do you do just plain silver or with EDTA? Or would you use both? Well, I start, I start with silver. Mm-hmm. And then I also have them do at night a nasal probiotic flush. Mm-hmm. And then also um, I'll have them put coconut oil in their nostrils because it's hard to kill infections in the sinuses mm-hmm. when they're dry. Yeah. So, so they'll do that for two weeks and then I'll move into using chelating PX, which is EDTA to, you know, to bust up the biofilm. And then um, if they have a fungus might, might use amphotericin or big spray if there's more cons. So whatever antibiotic they need, um, I'll use that. We'll, we'll be atomizing that. Oh, that's tremendous. And I love a couple of things you mentioned. First of all, that you start with silver without EDTA, because I think sometimes that biofilm busting is way too much. They get yeah. headaches or they get really sick because all of a sudden it's a dumping of the, the dead material that's being, I think of the biofilms, if you're listening as pond scum, it's like this kind of gross covering that keeps everything hidden from the antibiotics or the silver. So you right. need to bust that up to clear it out. But if you bust it up too much, too quickly, the system gets overwhelmed and the mast cells get angry too, right? I sure do. So I think of it as a gentle way in before I, in fact, that's the way how I, that's how I'll treat most people. We'll start in, I'll start gently and ramp them up. Um, 
Oh, yeah. tremendous. And the other yeah. thing you mentioned, the dryness, because not, a, not most of us aren't flying a lot nowadays, but just flying in an airplane, it's so dry. That's why people tend to get more sick or used to, again, now things are just very different, still toxic because they spray all these chemicals, but um, yeah. the dryness of the air. And here I am in Colorado, where which is really dry. That really makes a difference. The moisture, I love that you recommended. Now, are you having people just put it kind of uh, just in their nostrils a little bit? Yeah, yeah just have them take a Q-tip and just put Perfect. it in. Yeah. Okay. So instead of Vaseline, which is petroleum based, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's a great, great pearl. So we yeah. talked about nasal and then I interrupted you. What else would be the underlying factors in the chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia? So definitely heavy metals, which we already talked about. I think of this, it's a whole soup. So it's not salad, like here's yeah. a tomato, here's a piece of celery. It's the whole, the whole thing together in one soup. Um, so metals, Usually there's a high viral load. I'll, I'll measure people's nagalase. I love the Infecto Lab test, by the way, because wow. now we can use yeah. T cells to look at if an infection is active right now or not, as opposed to looking at antibodies where we have to kind of guess, right? Yeah. So um, I'll look, I'll use that test to see if the, there's a high viral load. Um, if there's mold, I like to look at the mold IgG at allergens as well as, as mycotoxins. So I'll look at that on LabCorp. Um, so basically I'm hunting for different infections and different toxins because those are the two things that I, that I think hijack the system. Of course, I'm looking at their hormones, their sex hormone panel and their thyroid because those are areas that are gonna be affected as well, causing fatigue. Excellent. So pathogens, toxins, infections, um, hormones, <laughs> hormones, and oh, this is great. And the um, gut, of course, the gut. Yes. And do you always do like stool and organic acids or how do you like to assess the gut? Yeah, I like to look, I like um, the GI map test. I find it to be the most sensitive. So I look there and most of my patients also have SIBO, mm -hmm. which I generally like to treat first. I've, I like the trio smart test because yes. They're looking at hydrogen sulfide, SIBO, and no other test has done that before. So that that'll that'll look at that'll give us a chance to find SIBO in ways we haven't been able to before. Yes. So. Yes. Now the key is then what do we do with hydrogen SIBO? I've read a little bit about some of the pearls for treatment, but if you do find the hydrogen sulfide, um, is there any particular things you do differently with treatments or herbs? You know, for sure, I'm having them decrease sulfur in their diet. Yeah. And then, but I'm using the same treatment mm -hmm. as I would for, for regular SIBO, which is the cyfaxin and flagell and yeah. the bismuth to bust up the biofilm, golden seal to prevent yeast. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Sounds so similar and so important. Cause again, that gut, like, I love that you mentioned two things that I think are so critical that you really can't get past and that's sleep and constipation. So if you have someone coming in that has uh, insomnia or constipation, no matter what kind of protocol you put them on, if they're not sleeping and they're not pooping, <laughs> you're not going to get very far, right? <laughs> oh, no, no, exactly. Um, what yeah. about pearls for sleep? Because a lot of these patients have sleep issues and it's related to everything else we talked about, but any tips or tricks that you have for helping patients sleep? Yeah, so I have an Ayurvedic sleep tea, which I really like. There's cardamom in it. Ooh. So cardamom helps people stay asleep. There's ashwagandha and shatavari in it. That can help people. Now there's some people who that doesn't help or you know the regular like valerian or gaba or l-theanine that's not helping them um i'll go to peptides uh -huh. for them so i like epitalon for sleep or delta inducing sleep peptide uh -huh. those really really help people and it, it makes me not have to use um i'd like to not use benzos <laughs> for their right, sleep right, right. i found that that peptides can 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 be a way around having to use Excellent. Benzo for those people who just can't sleep, no matter what herb I give them or no, what, no matter what sleep hygiene right. techniques we get. Yeah, so this can be tricky and, and the tick-borne infections can play into that too and the activation of the immune system. So it can be, I find that sleep issue for some people is really hard to hack. Um, but like you said, between peptides and herbs, and then there was some, oh, I was thinking um, antihistamines can be like hydroxazine and those can be really yeah. helpful at times. Ketophen, actually. Yes. So I give ketodophen for mast cell activation syndrome and it really helps them to fall asleep. There's the odd person I found in my practice that makes them groggy in the morning. Uh, yeah. Not too often, but sometimes mm -hmm. I can't give them ketodophen. 
Yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> great tips. Um, so let's talk about this cell danger response because yeah. I know your so Gordon Medical Center was where you had told me right before we got on live that you guys had actually done some of the research with Dr. Navu. So tell us first, what is it? And then you can just dive in. I can ask some questions, but I definitely want to talk about this. If you haven't heard about the cell danger response, this is groundbreaking. Yeah, so yeah. At, at Gordon Medical, um, we, we provided the patients that Dr. Uh, Navio did research on and this was right before I joined Gordon Medical, but, but Gordon Medical and Dr. Navio were, were involved in, in the research together then and wrote the paper on this and it is groundbreaking. So, yeah. so the cell danger response is modulated by mitochondria, which is the energy producing part of the cell. And it's, but it's also sensing when the cell's not getting the nutrients it should be getting. So that means that the cell's in danger. It's signaling the immune system to take action that there is danger. It can happen when there's a virus in here or a toxin that ties up nutrients. Um, and the mitochondria will then send a signal to other cells, but that signal is, is that it starts to send ATP outside of the cell. So actually around the cell membrane instead of inside the cell. But the important thing to remember is that it's not an on and off signal. There's a little bit of the signaling every day to help your body pay attention to, to when there is an invader, a pathogen or or a toxin or stress, whether that's emotional or, or physical stress. Um, so it doesn't have to be a disease. So it's really actually happening constantly as a normal defense mechanism. But when the signal persists, that's when illness occurs. So it's like there, there's, there's, there's a healing response that's stuck in this loop and it just can't stop. Mast cells are constantly activated. The immune system is constantly activated. So it's like trying to understand where do I cut that loop? How, how do I stop the cell danger response from happening? Speaking of chronic fatigue, Dr. Navio and, and Gordon Medical, the research occurred on chronic fatigue syndrome itself. Wow. Yeah. So, yes, yeah. So associated, I mean, he's associated cell danger response with Lyme disease, with autism, with chronic yeah. fatigue, with, yeah. So it's been really wide. Like it's one of the things that I know you and I, we can see it unifies a lot of these complex chronic illnesses that we see almost all of them actually. Exactly. Yeah. They're stuck in this repeating loop of incomplete recovery and re-injury and they're unable to fully heal. Talk a little about the, the cause there's the um, cell danger, the part phase one, two, and three, and each of those, if it gets stuck there, there's different sets of illnesses and things. Do you want to talk right. a little bit about some of those and the differences between the part? The sure. So part one involves the innate immune system. So the neutrophils, the macrophages, natural killer cells, monocytes, the mast cells. So these cells come out, the mast cells come to prime the immune system, right? And then the, the other cells will come out to, to, to begin the killing and may actually do the killing, right? But the infected cells at this point, they stop making normal amounts of ATP. And this is when they start to export the ATP to the cell membrane outside the cell. And that's the danger signal, uh, usually signaling the rest of the body and cells, hey, there's a danger here, there's a toxin, there, there's a bug that's activating the innate immune system. So we see it, if it happens in a lot of cells, that's when we start to see the sick behavior, fatigue, brain fog, body aches and pains. If it only happens a little bit, we're just gonna get a stuffy nose. Right, but at this point they're depending on glucose for energy instead of ATP because the mitochondria are now browning are browning out. So it's anaerobic respiration. They're producing little energy. So we'll see illnesses here. If we're stuck here, we'll see HPA axis um, issues, allergies, asthma, chronic infections, which are often underneath the chronic fatigue syndrome and the fibromyalgia that I see. Um, and so it can be stuck here, and in part two and part three, which I'll talk about in a minute. So it can be stuck in different parts and all in different systems of the body. So part two is when we start to rebuild uh, tissue damage and that cell proliferation. So the mm -hmm. mitochondria, they start to go back to producing more ATP, but it's still anaerobic. We're not burning fat still, we're still burning energy from glucose, but there's less of, infl of an inflammatory signal. So here it's more proliferative disorders, cancers, hypertension, different heart diseases. Mm -hmm. Then there's part three, where we're restoring intercellular communication. So the cells learn how to function as a part of the whole. Mm -hmm. So a lot of hormones are important here. Neurotransmitters are important here. So here we're gonna see illnesses like chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, um, autism, spectrum mm -hmm. disorder, PTSD, anxiety, depression. Mm -hmm. 
to the mind. And I love it because you really cover like all of medicine, right? Like this, this is such an underlying cellular, like we're talking about at the cell level, one of the things that goes wrong, which is why when Dr. Navu really has presented his data, all of us were just like, wow, this wow. is, I remember two years ago, right at ICI when he presented and you had yeah. been involved a little bit in the research. So maybe you knew some of the backstory, but for me and, and most of us who hadn't heard a lot of the research, it was literally like jaw dropping oh my goodness, this is amazing. Like, cause it just puts everything together. And I'm going to try I may not be exactly scientifically accurate, but for those of you who are listening and you're not super scientific, I'm going to try to explain in really simple terms, what's happening. You have a cell and when the cell spills its contents, it's broken, right? It like spills out. Then the contents get outside. That's what's triggering. This is outside the cell. It's like, it's, um, we call it like damage associated uh, receptors. So basically the damage to the cell, the contents of the cell got exploded or damaged or leaky. And then the outside is getting the signal that, oh, there's cell contents outside the cell. This is not good. So I think of it real simplistically as you've spilled contents of a cell that was damaged and outside the cell, there was a signal because your body knows it's very smart. It's like, this should not be outside the cell. It should be inside the cell. And that's the ATP. So the ATP is a cellular currency should be in the cell, making energy for the cell. If it gets outside the cell, this is the cell danger response. And again, super simplified, probably not completely scientifically accurate, but for those of you listening to understand, it's just the spilled contents, the cells broken, it's damaged. And because it's damaged, it's telling the body, oh, something is dreadfully wrong. You've got to you know, mop up this mess you've spilled on the floor. And that's kind of how I think of it um, in a simplistic way. Yeah. Exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then what do we do? Again, this is a cellular mechanism. There have been drugs studied to stop this that are highly effective. Unfortunately, they're not available. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Can't so, so, so <clears throat> it's interesting. I think in, in, med, in medicine, we're so good with A goes to B, mm-hmm. heart attack, broken bone, bullet wound medicine knows what to do, but Dr. Navio calls what we're talking about, the black box of healing, the the complex Mm -hmm. chronic illness. So this is where it becomes highly personalized. Mm -hmm. When we look at the genes, we look for the toxins, we look, we're we're looking for what is causing the most irritation in the system. And for my patients, all of these things we just talked about, Mm -hmm. but, but usually it's the immune system. That's, that's the loudest first and the mast cells. So back to, back to that. Yeah. Treating that back to where we started, which is starting with calming the mast cells, supporting immune system, clearing infections, treating heavy metals, toxicity, um, and then going down the road. Um, One question I just thought of as we're talking on fibromyalgia, I have heard some of the theories around having lactic acidosis, which is basically in the uh, tissues, you have a more acidic uh, environment, which can cause pain. And again, that can come from everything. It's not a new theory. It's nothing that's different from what we're already talking about. But have you found any sort of alkalinization therapies helpful, like um, say mineral water, Alka-Seltzer gold, um, some of those things that are more, or even alkaline diets. Have you done anything along those lines? Yeah, absolutely. Al- alkaline diets, I think really help for intermittent fasting. Yeah. Um, for sure, the detoxification is going to help. Yes. Excellent. Um, yeah. So what else would we look at? So let's go back to, let's talk about chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia just slightly separately because they are very similar in mechanism, but we might treat them slightly differently. Let's start with yeah. fatigue because fatigue is most people who are sick, they have some sort of, they may not qualify for chronic fatigue. Most of them do, but even if they don't, they usually have, and it usually is associated with brain fog, which is yeah. kind of, and it's so funny because those of us in medicine, brain fog isn't really defined, right? But every patient that we ever talk to, if we say brain fog, they know what we mean. So we use that term a lot. And how would you define brain fog or what would people be complaining of when they come to you with that? Yeah. So most of my patients have brain fog actually. Mm-hmm. So in tick-borne illness, I find the brain fog is is um, is actually more tied to pain mm-hmm. than than in yeah. than in people who have viral mo- mostly just viral issues. So, but in both populations, the brain fog will manifest pretty will will sound similar or be experienced similarly. So I just I, I went into a room and I forgot what I went there for. I went to the grocery mm-hmm. store and I, I picked up peas, but I meant to get potatoes or things like that. Um, Or I just can't think straight. A lot of them say, I think I'm losing my mind. I actually find it's more the tick-borne illness patients that it's that extreme where they say, I think I'm going crazy. Yes. 
But for women, a lot of times, if, if they're not sick, we could just fix the hormones. That'll help them, right? But for these patients, if we fix the hormones, they're still gonna feel like they have brain fog. So that's another, another sign that there's, there's something else going on. I love that because I remember 15, 20 years ago when I started in functional medicine, I have a menopause patient or a patient with hypothyroid and it'd be very simple, straightforward. We'd replace the hormones or balance their hormones or give them thyroid and they'd feel better. Yeah. And I don't know when I've seen one of those kinds of patients lately because there's so many layers. Like if it were only that simple, certainly there are people that you know, that's all it needs is just a little tweaking. But I find that to be kind of a superficial level, not superficial. It's very, very important, but it's a, su- it's a superficial enough that what we're talking about here is usually way deeper causes. So yeah. just doing that alone, unfortunately, nowadays, at least for my practice, doesn't usually hundred percent turn them around, right? No, definitely not. I wish it would. <laughs> but, it <laughs> and they wish it too. They say, yeah. okay, now look, the labs say that my progesterone and my estrogen are back into balance, but I still feel the same. I still felt terrible, right? Yeah. yeah. And I say, but that, you know, that's just a foundation for you now. At least we have this foundation set. Now we have to really get into the nitty gritty of, of working on the immune system and, and working on bringing out the insults. But what I also find is that once I can take, we can take the knife out, like the bugs, the toxins out, but the, the, the system, sorry, the symptoms still persist. Yeah. yeah but it's also like a memory, right? Even though you've got cleaned up the terrain, the yeah. body still remembers and can kind of stay. What do you do with that? Uh, I've, I've seen, we may even go into this, but I feel like um, emotional trauma, emotional health, some of these limbic system things are so critical. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts on that and what would you do? Yeah, I think that that's really, that's a really big piece. Um, that's when a lot of times I might start to use regenerative medicine, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, exosomes or, or biological allografts, those I found can really help. NAD, IV mm-hmm. can help a lot at that point as well. Um, that's that's looking at the biochemical piece, but you just talked about and what I would consider such an important piece, which is the, the healing piece. Yeah. These people have normally experienced a lot of trauma in yeah. their lives. That's what I find. They've had, um, just like these illnesses have hijacked the different systems of their body, they've also had had people in their lives do what I would call hi- hijacking their lives in some way, so much trauma. And so that, that piece is really, really important. I like to give them craniosacral therapy and we have some amazing healers that we work with as well. So we, I send them, to, send them to that, send them to the healers for that kind of work, acupuncture. Mm-hmm. Um, I like love that. that you're mentioning that because I feel the same and I, those aren't my areas of expertise, but I know people who do it. So whether it's somatic based trauma therapies, whether there's programs like DNRS, yes. the program safe and sound by Porges, or there's a bunch of programs out there that are really helpful. Yeah. Love cranial sacral, love acupuncture um, yeah. and naturopathy. Some of the um, traditional, uh, we have a um, emotional um, what's the name of the, um, there's a couple of the emotional remedies types of things with homeo- homeopathic remedies and things. Again, not right. in my area of expertise, but those all together can be really profound at that layer because of what happens with these illnesses, even if you're healthy, you have a good family support system, um, the body subconsciously sees this mold or Lyme as a, as a um, trauma. And so even if you're super healthy and you don't, you you weren't abused as a child, it's still a trauma. And then the medical system, I think, sadly, most of the time further traumatizes the patients. I agree. Yeah. They really do. Yeah. Because because they haven't been accepted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They've been told they're crazy or go take this med for your mind or it's not, I mean, you might manifest as insomnia or bipolar or depression, anxiety, but these are not primarily psychological issues. Exactly. Yeah, they're secondary mm-hmm. to the issue at hand, which is usually the infection, the yes. toxin. Yeah, I, I wonder nowadays if, if all mental illness isn't really gut microbiome, cell danger response. I don't know if there's any any pure psychological disorders anymore because I can always find a root cause that's Me actually too. physiological, right? Exactly, exactly. And then once it takes some time to, to, to turn these people around, but once, once they're turned around, I see big shifts in their, yeah. in their psychology yeah. and moods and mean, relationships. And it's amazing, right? The whole yeah. dynamic shift. So yeah. it's oh. amazing. 
Well, let's shift in our last couple of minutes because we've really covered a lot of ground. And like we talked a little about the limbic and some of these things too, but what about just whether it's social support, isolation, um, especially with COVID and the pandemic and all that we've experienced, what are some kind of mental health tips or social tips or things that you might encourage your patients to do just to have a support system or anything in that realm that you would think about or encourage them or nature walks or things like yeah. that? Yeah, there's a lot of support groups out there. Sometimes I've heard patients tell me that, oh, that just really drags me into my diagnosis more. That's just that's just not what I want. And other people say, oh, I needed to meet more people just like myself. Yeah. So I think that really, I think that everybody who who's interested should, should try to experience it and see if it's for them or not. Some people it's great. Some people, they don't want that. And those, I think those are people who are more solitary people. And for them, for everybody, nature walks, I find grounding really helps just putting their feet in the sand, yeah. feeling the sunshine on them. Yeah. Um, you know, mm, I love that. Um, yeah. And yeah, you you get, uh, you're in the Bay Area, did you say? Yeah. You don't always get sunshine. You're a little... <laughs> yeah, we get, it can be cool down here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah. I love the earthing and grounding. And then I do you guys recommend uh, pulsed electromagnetic PEMF in your clinic at all. Yes. And no. So I've seen it blow up a lot of our patients, <laughs> you know, they're just not quite ready for it. So more towards the end of treatment, I've seen it work really well. And with that NADD and exosomes and stuff. So the powerhouses that, yeah, because yeah. I found for me personally at this level now, I love it, but I think it would have blown me out of the water five years ago when I was, yeah. Really yeah. <laughs> That makes sense. Um, let's see. I was thinking, I wanted to go back to one other thing. You mentioned coffee enemas. And um, I went to Switzerland for a detox clinic the last two years before when we could travel. And um, one thing that was there that they had these coffee enema kits that were just so amazingly easy to use. It's a Swiss mountain clinic used to be Paracelsus. So we actually imported those and I have them at the clinic. I want to be sure and let the listeners know if you want an easy way, because I agree with you, the coffee enemas can be so profound and you can get online kits and setups. And do you have those at your clinic that you sell or recommend at all? We don't, but you know, Ben Greenfield wrote a really good article. So I just send people that website. Perfect. So I'd love to hear about the one. Perfect. Year. Yeah. I was going to say, I'll include a link down here. I just want to mention it because it's such a unique thing that we have at our clinic and we can ship to you anywhere in the U S um, and we actually import them from Europe because they're not made in the U S yes. and yes. it's a really simple, yeah, it's a really simple setup with a bottle um, that's BPA free and then a setup with a tubing and literally an instant, really, really clean, um, low roasted uh, green coffee with uh, charcoal in it. So it's a, it's a, a German yeah. formula. It's the cleanest thing I've ever found. And then you just put it in the bottle, warm tap water, shake it up and you're done. So super easy to use. So I'll include a link in case anyone's interested, because it's just one of those things where I found being in Switzerland, I'm like, we need this in the U S. And when I tried to figure out who had them, no one had them. So, so now we, yeah, so I'll put a link. Right. That. Yeah. Um, so last bit here, where can people find you? Where can people find more about you? Are you accepting new patients? Tell us a little bit more about Yeah. Uh, yeah I'm accepting new patients and you can go to www.gordonmedical.com or just look up Gordon Medical Associates and um, all the information is over there. And so people come from all over the country, particularly for the IV therapies, actually. Okay. And so we've got, you know, it used to be when you were talking about socialization, it used to be that we had a big IV suite and people would sit there and socialize and it would be their, their hangout time, yeah. people just like them. And they loved it. Now we can't, we can't do it that way. People have their own private room yeah. and, and we take all the precautions that we need to, um, to make sure that it's safe in there, but so you won't have company in there anymore, but, <laughs> but you still do. And, that's great. and I have had patients that I've had that have been to, so again, nothing but good reviews and just been neat to share a few patients once in a while that have been, you know, yeah. back and forth. so um, I can uh, attest to that. Just the great care. Um, now, the other thing you mentioned right before we got on, you're doing a summit. Tell us about what's coming up with the summit. Yeah. So Dr. Gordon and I are going to be hosting a mycotoxin and chronic illness summit. Great. Um, to doctor summits. I'm very excited about it. And hopefully you'll be, you'll be participating. I would and, love to. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's going to be in June. Okay. So we're just, we're just starting right now. 
and we're hosting it with Dr. Christine Schaffner. Oh, wonderful. Cause I love this stuff. So if you're listening, um, I'll be sure. And if you uh, go to the Facebook page, uh, follow me on Instagram, just Dr. Jill Carnahan, you will see the updates there. I'll be sure and get information from you guys and share those links. So if you're interested in that summit, stay tuned. I will have it on all my social media pages for, for everybody and we'll share. And I would love to um, be a part of it. Thank you. We'd love to have you. Awesome. Well, this, um, I can't believe how quickly our hour goes, but I, know. <laughs> I think we've got some great information. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we've got your websites. I'll be sure and include them. And uh, thanks again for all the great information. Thank you so much for having me. Such an honor.